Hey folks, today we're thrilled to introduce MetaPets, the next generation of digital best friends from Unreal Engine. Prepared for cuddles and ready to play in a wide range of virtual parks and yards, MetaPets will be created by you using the new, easy to use MetaPet Creator. This is just a sneak peek. Stay tuned for future updates. Have you heard? We're celebrating our first ever Unreal Indies week. All week, we've been highlighting the stories of incredible teams from all around the world and sharing their achievements, struggles, and victories in video game development. On the feed, discover their inspirational tales, how they've overcome technical challenges, unearthed funds to carry on with their development, and more. Every year, twice in fact, we put out student showcase reels that reflect some of the amazing projects we've been sent or shown during that time period. If you're looking to stand out from the rest of the class, then act fast and submit your Unreal project for our Spring Student Showcase by Friday, April 2nd. Get the details below. Want to know how Weta Digital created the realistic creature grooms in the Meerkat short film? Then you'll for sure want to check out our latest webinar, where you'll learn how to create hair, fur, and feathers from the experts. Watch the full webinar on the Unreal Engine YouTube channel. Twin Motion 2021 released earlier this week, bringing with it a bridge to Unreal Engine, the ability to share your projects with anyone, anywhere using Presenter Cloud, direct access to thousands of Quixel mega scans right from Twin Motion, and more. Find a complete list of updates in their release notes and then take Twin Motion for a spin. Cesium for Unreal is available on the Marketplace. The free, open source plugin unlocks decades of 3D geospatial technology for Unreal Engine, empowering you to create applications using full scale, real world content. Fly over to the Marketplace and download it today. And now to highlight this week's top weekly karma earners many thanks to Grumble Bunny, Every Nun, Clockwork Ocean, Bama Game, Shadow River, Luna Nellis, Rock and Rolla, Kuro Phoenix 7, Oz Bit Me, and Nacho Monkey 2. Put your hands up for the Haven Virtual Concert Experience. Presented by the Game Bakers and G4F Records, the concert was designed by artist and musician Danger, featuring tracks from Haven and Fury soundtracks and others. Jump into the groove via your favorite console or PC platform. Need help scripting your story, quests, dialogues, or other event-based systems? Well, Moth Doctor is in, and they've released version 1 of their FlowGraph plugin for Unreal Engine. You can download the plugin for free on GitHub and watch their tutorial presentation on YouTube. And last up, explore the fabled woods in the dark and mysterious narrative adventure from Cyberpunk Studios. Despite the picturesque beauty on the surface, terrible secrets lurk among the shifting boughs. Take the first step into the woods on Steam. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hi everyone and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host Victor Broden and today we've invited four of our evangelists to talk a little bit about their experiences launching their first games. Uh, let me introduce Alex Stevens. Hey. Andrea Suka. Hey. Martina Santoro. Hola. And Samuel Bass. Hi. Welcome to the stream. Um, like I said, we've uh, are going to talk a little bit about your experiences launching your first game, since all of you come from various forms of game development backgrounds and have some form of experience inside the, uh, the indie universe. Um, now, we have prepared questions for discussion, but feel free to submit your own in chat today, and we will either take them throughout the stream or at the end when we're doing a little bit of a QA. and a um, First question coming right up. Um, I would like each of you to introduce yourself and uh, why don't you let the audience know a little bit how you got into game development. Uh, let's start with Alex. Hey, I'm Alex Stevens. I'm one of the evangelists here um, for Australia and New Zealand. Um, and I cover mostly, I'm a programmer, so I started in the games industry probably officially 2012-ish. Um, however, I'd always been tinkering with a bit of programming and Flash and stuff like that. So. Um, first games were built in Flash with action script and just little side scrollers and little shoot 'em up games, kind of stuff like that. 
Um, played around with a little bit of CryEngine back in like, I think it was 2010, something like that. Um, but this was while I was studying at uni. And then out of uni, one of my mates was like, hey, do you want to start playing with games and um, UDK? And we started on a horror project called Quantas. Um, and so I uh, started developing that. And yeah, we can probably go on a little bit more about that later on in the stream. But um, suffice to say, it was interesting, interesting. But uh, traditionally, I come from a, um, an engineering background, not so much a computer science or um, game design background. So uh, got a little bit of a different lens there. Awesome. Let's move over to Andreas. Yeah, I started like 20 years ago. I'm I'm in that kind of, um, I'm this generation where there were no schools or no anything, even, I come from Germany. I'm evangelist for Central Europe. And here, 20 years ago, nobody knew that there's even game development. So uh, when I first started it, um, it was hard to convince everybody around me that this is a real job. But I started actually studying engineering and I got married. We had two kids. So I was always looking for the opportunity of side jobs. <laughs> and Blue Byte, uh, back in the days, we were looking for testers. So I applied there and I started as a tester. And for after two weeks, someone came into the room and asked, is here someone who can script or do something? And it was like, yeah, here. Which was not completely true, but you, <laughs> you have to try. Uh, so they were sitting me in front of a PC, giving me a Lua book. Uh, so Lua scripting is where I actually came from. And then I had to script for Settlers, which is a strategy building up game, a tutorial, which was awful. So it was the worst <laughs> thing I ever did. Um, uh, and then then it, the company grow. Uh, I was sticking. It, it wasn't too bad what I did there. So they kept me. And then Ubisoft bought the company and then it wasn't back in the days there were no real game designer so they were looking around at ubisoft and saying okay we bought this company who's game designer here and suddenly they named me so <laughs> suddenly i was game designer suddenly i was responsible for a big brand in, in, in germany at least for a game and then um yeah i i went from there i sticked for ubisoft for for a long time and then i left and founded a publisher a small mobile games publisher uh, and grow that with venture capital. So that was kind of special. Then I I left there and did some freelancing. And uh, 2017, I released a small indie game called Long Journey Home with, uh, with Unreal Engine. So I was on the other side. Um, and um, I also managed, uh, I did a lot of different stuff. I managed the Indie Arena booth, which is the biggest independent booth on, on Gamescom that days. And um, yeah, but but uh, I was always in touch with some people from Epic and uh, I joined and uh, I don't regret any minute of it. So now I'm in the mix of making cool stuff and talking with developers and trying to help them. Um, so I'm looking also forward for this stream. This is nice. Thank you, Andres. Uh, Martina, please go ahead. Um, well, so I'm Martina Santoro. I'm evangelist for Latin America. I'm based in Buenos Aires in Argentina. So it's kind of like almost Antarctica. <laughs> this is how far away uh, I am. Um, I've been working in the games industry for over the last, yes, like 10, 10 or 15 years. Um, I actually started working in the animation uh, world. And with my partner, with Lucas, we used to go to all these festivals and present our projects to um, production companies and they were like super ambitious you know like every time you have like this comic book that uh, you know like expanded the universe of the characters in uh, a movie or a tv series or a video game and people would say like well this is amazing let's do this there is no way I'm going to give you money for your game <laughs> but can you do this with my IP so that's kind of like how we got into the gaming uh, world uh, as kind of like as Andreas uh, mentioned, just to be there to do that. There weren't many uh, game studios in, in Argentina, even though the industry it's around also like 20 years old. Um, again, no places to, to go and study. And um, especially it wasn't that easy either, you know, to convince your parents that uh, you, you were going into this industry. They had like no idea what you were doing, what they were supposed to expect. And it's kind of like... Um, I think it, it's uh, harder to, <laughs> to to tell your parents you're going into the games industry than coming out of the closet sometime uh, in, in this part of the world. 
Um, so we were super lucky. We started to work with all these um, companies that were mainly from the animation industry, from, from films and developing games for them. Until one day we decided to uh, work on our own thing. You know, we weren't working with a brand. We weren't working with somebody else's IP, with a, a brand guide or anything like that. And uh, we created our first uh, point and click and adventure. Um, Andreas knows <laughs> what I'm talking about. Um, and that kind of like presented us uh, to the world as an actual independent game studio. We actually um, show this game in festivals and in markets around the world. And we uh, kind of like got this opportunity to stop making kind of like advert games, you know, like games that were um, thought for advertising something else, but they were actual games. You know, we were game work, working on games that we um, were completely free to to decide. Um, yes, uh, about their destiny. I don't know. Um, so we again went to markets and festivals, and and we pitched this idea, and everybody told us. This looks great. Um, there is no way we are going to give you money for this. <laughs> so the same thing happened all over again. Uh, but the cool thing was that it was kind of like our uh, presentation uh, portfolio to have a game that was beautiful, that was fun, that was actually uh, entertaining and playable. You know, we actually could send something to someone and somebody can test it and, and enjoy it. So it opened us a lot of doors. We started working with companies from all over the world and um, and and just, you know, like kind of like we're like committed full time to develop original content. And that was an amazing opportunity. Um, I've been always also very active in the community, working in the Argentinian um, games development industry, uh, working regionally, uh, helping other um, countries to to get resources and funding and help uh, from from different um, resources that we have. So um, I worked for like 10 years as a member of, of the local like ICDA that it's called ADVA. Um, I even got to be the first female president of ADVA uh, a couple of years ago. And um, together with the other 11 countries, we started the um, Latin American uh, Federation to <laughs> kind of like Star Trek work together to, to help uh, developers in, in the Latin region. Um, so yes, that's mainly it. Um, I've been knowing uh, Paulo and Chris and, and David and, and all the um, evangelism team uh, in Latin America for a really long time. And when in 2019, they asked me if I wanted to join, um, it was actually a weird question. They told me, like, do you know someone that can join us? And I was like, yes, of course. You know, I can introduce you to so many people. I'm like a living, um, <laughs> you know, like an agenda or something like that. And they told me, like, you idiot. <laughs> we wanted you to work with us. <laughs> so uh, it was a, a very romantic um, way of popping the question. And that's how I, I joined the team. I'm sorry I made it so long. <laughs> It's a great story. Um, why don't we hear from you as well, Samuel, before we start digging in? Hi, I'm uh, Sam. I'm evangelist for the Americas, and I am the new kid. But I am not the new kid with game development. I have been a game developer for 26 years now, more than a quarter century, which is terrifying in that I think I've forgotten more than I know at this point. Uh, I started out, I'm from England, I started out as a kid with an Atari computer, which had no games in the UK, so I started making my own games as a kid, and had the big dream of moving to California and making video games when I was a teenager, so I did, and got a job at a little developer in the Bay Area making DOS games, back when that was a thing, and from there went to EA, and was at EA for 12 years doing AAA things and more niche strategy game things, made the Command and Conquer games for a while, uh, worked on some Medal of Honor games, learned a ridiculous amount about shipping a game every year on the dot, no delays. Like to say eight games, eight years, I learned a lot. I will never do that again. Um, and then after my time at EA came to an end, I got into indie VR development, uh, joined joined up with some friends to start a company called 310. We made a game called Adrift for the Oculus Rift and later Vive in Unreal 4. We were 
an Oculus Rift launch title. So we were right up there on the sort of the cutting edge of VR, but we were a team of five people, uh, plus contractors and support from our publisher, obviously, but we were a small team making a very ambitious game on a world engine with new tech um, and trying to get it out the door, uh, which was very relevant to today, today's discussion. Uh, and I learned that everything I learned before was not necessarily applicable to you have five people and the question, is there someone to do that? Yes, it's you. You should go do it. Uh, and so after working in indie VR for the last couple of years, uh, spending some time in story-based gaming, uh, which was pretty fun working in a more narrative space, uh, joined up with Epic to promote indie game development because my real passion is democratizing game development. I want everyone to be able to make games and this seems like a good way to help them do it. That's where I am. Hi. Welcome, Sam, and relatively new to the team as well. Um, exciting to have you here. Awesome. So hopefully the audience know a little bit about who you are, um, but now I wanted us to dig into sort of the some of your experiences of going through the roller coaster of uh, starting a team, developing a game, and then uh, hopefully launching it. And so uh, leading to that, um, let's start off with sort of, was there any project that uh, that you launched that you would consider a a success, and uh, what does success mean to you, um, sort of back then and then today where you are, um, and uh, you know do a little retrospective um, on any of these possible successes that you've had. I'm just gonna open up the floor to uh, anyone who likes to take uh, the lead here. Yeah, I can I can start. It's uh, as Sam already implied it. Uh, it is. It, it is highly depending where you are and what you do defines a lot what your what is a success story. So if you ask me, I, I would have really to think about, okay, what is a success story? So I launched games with Ubisoft. They were pretty successful. So that's a success story. I launched my small indie game, which was financially not extremely successful, but that's a success, success story for me because we built something up from stretch and we did something unusual. Uh, and that was holding up. So it might not have been from financial perspective like the big thing, um, but from from the content or from from the ki how we develop game, it was extremely cool because it was one of the games where we had like sound and music and art like from the beginning. So we first did the emotion we want to achieve, and then we did the mechanics. And I come from a game mechanic background, so to do that in that way with only eight people. Um, that that was awesome. This is an awesome, awesome success story. So the first th question you have to ask yourself, and that's also true for your indie studio if you start, even if you're a solo developer or if you have two or three people or if you are like, okay, we are aiming for a prototype and then trying to get more money so we make it grow very fast. Um, the question you have to ask yourself is what what are the KPIs, so to say? So what what is your... What is your um, what is a success for you? Is it maybe a success to get your company on the map? Like having survived the first game and then grow from there? Or is it like, I want to make money with the first game? Then you would maybe approach it differently, which could mean like, let's do like small games and churn them out like one month, each month one game until one, one fits. That would be different than like saying, okay, we are five people and we spend half a year on a prototype where we spent like 10 people on uh, on two years for for game uh, for, for, for a full game. And it depends where you are in your life. So when I started Long Journey Home, um, I turned 40. And the reason I wanted to make this is a game is called The Long Journey Home. So it's about finding your way home. So I turned 40. So I questioned myself, okay, I'm 40. I have two old grown kids. They will leave the house soon. So where am I? <laughs> Did I come home in a more metaphorical sense? Um, so for me to be able to work on that for for two years was a success, despite how, even if it would have been an absolutely failure, <laughs> it would have been a success for me because I could spend my time on that. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's that's very much my metric. Is yes, if I'm working at a big studio and I make a big studio game, then there are clear metrics for success that we're trying to hit where you want to sell that many copies. But 
you know, when we went made adrift, that was a game we made from the heart. And it was about an emotion and the awe of VR and the feeling of isolation and really building a mood and a story. And yes, we wanted to be successful. Who doesn't want to be successful? But on a personal level, the fact that the game achieved our goals of creating that emotion and that sort of experience and managed to ship relatively clean with the Oculus Rift, which is a pretty nifty thing to do. That was my one sort of more techie measure of success is can you ship it clean? Because one of the hardest things about getting a game out the door is knowing which bugs you have to fix. So I was like, I would like a drift to ship in a way that it doesn't crash on people. And if there are bugs, they're not crazy bugs and we can go fix them. And it became very much a thing if someone would post something on Twitter, oh, hey, cause this weird thing happens. And we'd be right there going, okay, cool. We're gonna go take a look at that. And, you know, it made, it, it was a very clean launch in that respect. And I, it was like emotionally meaningful. And also as a technical designer, it made my brain happy because it wasn't built jankily. And for me, we go completely on the other side of the spectrum where like Sam's kind of in the middle where it's like the feel good and the tech designer side of things where I'm going full tech designer because being a programmer, I'm just like, I just want to do cool stuff in the engine, break it apart, make it bend to my will. Um, and so like for me, uh, measure of success is just like, did I get this game running optimally? There's still a little bit like, of an art side of things, um, but it's definitely a like, did I get this running on frame? Because like I'm a VR developer as well, um, and so back to the game for me is uh, my satisfaction. But also the um, putting in the um, the grease, like uh, the lifting your um, uh, what's the idiom? I'm terrible with I'm a spoonerism Elbow. guy. Elbow grease, that's the one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, kind of like that stuff, just uh, getting in the hard yards, um, pushing something out that people can enjoy. Um, and yeah, it's probably a little bit more of a simplistic approach, but I definitely enjoy the process and working with a team as well. So for success for me, it's definitely more about uh, the result of the community and working with some great people. And in retrospect, oh, sorry, go ahead, Martina. Oh, um, well, I think it, it has um, maybe like a, a different meaning uh, for us. You know, in Latin America, we don't have many resources. Uh, there wasn't uh, an epic mega grant or anything like that back then. Um, so just surviving for us, I think it meant success. Just the, the experience of um, keeping a game and, and launching it and actually going through the process of, of uh, learning all these steps. I mean... Um, when we um, uh, started working, we, we got, for example, to work with Square Enix in a very small game for uh, Latin America. Uh, it was it's, uh, The name was uh, Ultimo Carnaval. It was a mobile game, so it wasn't uh, anything like Tomb Raider or, um, I don't know, uh, Final Fantasy. But the thing was that just, you know, for us, going through all this process, it meant uh, working with publishers, working with people from around the world, learning more about ourselves or how to organize a team. It was kind of like I survived Square Enix. Um, what's the name of this? The generals things, you know, in the army <laughs> that you get. Um, so each of those steps um, kind of like taught us a lot. So for the next project, I think we were in a better position to keep growing. Um, we got to work with uh, Cartoon Network or, or Disney or, or Congregate. And um, even if some of those projects um, weren't published or, or weren't um, successful um, releases, like I think like our most successful game, it's, it's um, an endless runner with Mr. Bean, you know, this guy. <laughs> so it's either you love him or you hate him, but you know who Mr. Bean is, right? Um, Nobody and at the him. same time, you know, it, it, it wasn't the game that reflected our interests our, as uh, indie devs, right? So it's kind of crazy that just for us to, to, to actually keep making games, keep engaging with the community, getting all these opportunities or working in new platforms, um, or getting featured, you know, like those kind of things when, when you were uh, working on your own. Um, I think that 
looking back now, I think that those were our our biggest successes. Um, uh, I I think what you can already hear a bit is, I mean, what I personally like with games, and it's all reflected a little bit, is like everybody has his own kind of view and taste to it. So um, every, I mean, I love games. I love making games more than playing, actually. Um, I love making games because I learn a lot about myself and I see a lot of cool questions coming in and I want a little bit to go in that direction as well because there's a lot of questions about marketing and stuff. So I think one goal you have, and especially the smaller you are, so if you're only one one person making a game or if you're three, that's already a big difference. So the, the, the people who do the game first have to figure out what, what is a talent and what do they want to do and what don't they want to do and where they maybe need help. So a friend of mine is a solo developer right now with a pretty successful one and he hates marketing, but he has he has found good people who help him with marketing. So he he's saying, okay, that's that's my thing is making the game. I can make the game great. I'm not so great in doing the marketing thing. And he realized early enough not to try it by himself. because So, so finding out first what you want to do and what's your passion and where do you think your talent is most most useful for is, is already one part of the journey well marketing assets are hard too i mean that is one of the key lessons you learn making a game is that making a good screenshot is not just a matter of taking a bunch of screenshots and picking one and making a video asset or a trailer or it you know it's hours or if not weeks of work to get it to the level of quality to promote your game so do you have the time to do that if not who does who can help you and this is and do you and do you have the eye for it i think especially like mm -hmm. you see that a lot so take a look at i mean even if you're a gamer and not a game developer take a look on on steam take a look on on all, any platform take a look at the screenshots i have there so if it's like oh yeah the qa can make a screenshot when they play that's not how you will sell your game in the best way. So maybe you are lucky and have someone in QA who has a really good eye for it. But I mean, if you look, you cannot copy what the big companies are doing. Like they're building systems for that in the game. So someone can make really proper screenshots, try to recreate a special move, a moment in, in, and then um, uh, even go over it and do, do, do custom things to it. But first you have to ask yourself, what does, when you do the marketing stuff, what does your, what message do you want to transport? And then you have to find a good way to, to, to make this visually. So this is, this is so many different talents and it's extremely hard to make a game by completely by your own. It is extremely hard and people don't get it. So, so players, I'm, I, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to say some, something wrong here, but Players don't get it. It's it's still a kind of a black box for them. So for them, it's still like, yeah, you click some buttons here and then the game is done. But actually, it's extremely hard. It and then anything. comes all the other stuff on top. And yeah. then one, one tiny comment uh, about something you were saying, Andy. It's kind of like nobody knows how many kinds of people we have behind one game. So we have this myth going around where we have... Uh, I don't know, people in dark caves, you know, like kind of like coding and seeing the matrix. And it's kind of like, well, we do need people from marketing. We need graphic designers. Uh, of course, we need accountants and lawyers. It's just not uh, only people that know how to code, how to program. We also need so many different kinds of, of profiles in a team. So if you actually don't have that interest, um, something I, I, I'm, I'm in love with in this industry is that it opened me, not only my team, but me, myself, so many doors and, and actually um, allowed me to try and do so many different things, right? Because, I don't know, inside of my team, I was uh, developing relationships with potential partners or investors or working with, um, I don't know, the, the consoles, you know, the people from the hardware or the different platforms for distribution. But then at the same time, I had to learn how to talk to the press, you know, and that's like a different language. You have to organize the information in a different way. And I think I could do that because my partners completely believed in me, you know, like they trusted me and I trusted them while they were staying at the studio working the actual game. Um, so it's, it's crazy to see how many people you need. Of course, you can do everything on your own. It will maybe take you longer. 
Um, but if you can find people that are passionate about these different verticals, it's I think it's it's only better, right? And it also depends what costs your energy and what gives you energy. So I always try to judge a little bit what I can do depending on if I do it and the day is over, do I still have like like some energy left or if I'm completely drained out? And all the stuff I learned in the last years, especially all the stuff that's draining me out, I try to give someone else because I obviously not in the mood for that. So and it's a it's a it's it's a learning process and it's not just a game development learning process. I think it's a life learning process to figure out what you want to do and what you can do. Well, I think and we... identifying on your team as well, like I know that my co-developer, he was great at the marketing side, but I was way better at the biz dev side, right? So um, we just had like an unspoken kind of agreement that, okay, he does all of the marketing stuff and then I'll go out to the platform partners, publishers and stuff like that. And I was good at that. Um, and just rolling with it and accepting that, okay, we're not all superheroes and can do everything, right? Um, and allowing trust in someone else, like, Big oh, yeah. thing for indie dev is trust. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. That, that, but also identifying. I mean, that's the thing. If you are not an expert in one category, it's hard to judge if someone else is. So very often you might meet someone who is really passionate about something and you say, "Yeah, that's a great guy. Let's work together." But it might not work out, and you, it's, it's hard to judge. <laughs> yes, yeah, it might just be the loudest per person yes. in the room, right? <laughs> yes. Especially when you're in a small team, is yeah. a problem because there's only four people in the room. Well, that's find... one thing. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to bring up is with partnerships, part of sort of a lot of what you've been talking about is reaching out to people is a lot of times that's where you find the support you need is whether it's through a publisher or a hardware partner or, you know, one of the console manufacturers or even, you know, some, you know, someone in a big publisher in another country might be interested in your project and go, yeah, we can also give you some funding or some tech support or whatever. Not everything has to be on you. You can reach out. But to do that, you need to be willing to do the work to reach out to people. And yeah, not all of us are super socially skilled. And it requires a certain amount of that. So if there's someone on your team who is comfortable doing that, you have to, you know. Yes, especially now that we have this opportunity of, um, I don't know how this is going to sound, but, you know, we, we are kind of like at home, you know, like um, maybe a year ago we had to go to GDC in San Francisco or Gamescom in Germany, you know, we have to move somewhere and it was something you, you needed to get ready physically, right? <laughs> I remember like uh, getting, you know, like all my my water and vitamins and things for my throat because I knew I was going to be talking from eight in the morning until late night um, in an after party or something like that. And, and I had to be, uh, you know, like in a really good mood to, to interact with so many people. Uh, but now um, you don't have to travel anywhere and we are all stuck at, at home. Um, you can actually use this as an opportunity to participate and engage in, in as many events as you can to try and, and talk with people and Everybody understands you are at home, but you are going to be more comfortable. You know, you don't have to put on um, any kind of makeup. <laughs> I don't know. In my case, it's like I'm wearing a T-shirt and I'm, I'm so happy. Um, yeah, so... Like nobody knows I'm wearing pants, right? Like, <laughs> right. You, you do? Doing it, whatever. <laughs> you do? Just trust that I am. <laughs> Victor didn't put that on the list of to-dos for this stream. So. That's the end of the episode. It'll be the big reveal. Dude, uh, I put a bra <laughs> only for you today. I haven't put a bra in, in 12 months. So, yes, this is for you, Victor. Um, but, okay. but, yes, I don't know. It's, it's kind of like different kind of profiles, you know, of different kind of people. And, and I think that's something beautiful in, in the games industry. If you can find I someone that can do that job, and then, of course... If you're planning to release your game in China, of course, go and try the, the perfect match for you that can actually, um, you know, like make your game more successful in China than if you try to do it on your own, right? It's so when, not just localization, right? When it comes to, to this, we work together. I mean, if you are in a 300-person team and one person isn't like top-notch, that's okay. Nobody will maybe notice for a long time. If you're in a two-person team and one is not is not top-notch or is it like not in line with the rest, then 50% of your company is, <laughs> is going in the wrong direction. So that already says a lot. That's one thing. And what I can only advise to is try to find someone who is complementary to you. So for me, 
Uh, I founded my last company with Dirk. Dirk is uh, was an engine programmer on at Ubisoft there on Settlers. We had an own engine there. And then we we started this company. And he is completely, in many, many ways, an opposite of, of me. Um, and that was really good. And we didn't agree on all. And we were not the best friends or something. Um but we were really he 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 was the one who was who was completing me. And when we, for example, made the evaluation saying what technology do we want to use? So we were I come from a time where there were no no Unreal, no Unity, no Godot, no default name them all. There were not so many stuff out there you could get without spending money. Um so I came from an age where you each time you start a new project, you're evaluating again completely from scratch. What is there now? Okay, there's a C4 engine. How much does it cost? So you do your evaluation, etc. So when we started the company, we did actually the same. So we were looking at on different options from making our own kind of stitching together thing, looking at Unity, you're looking at Unreal, and we went with Unreal because um, and and that, that was a there were we are already where our collaboration starts very very well. So he's C++ programmer hardcore he knows his shit so he's really really good oh sorry uh sorry victor now i get how, how many how many coins do i have in the in the swear jar already in the stream i don't know i think that makes it two okay <laughs> <laughs> so so he was looking from that perspective i was looking more for the content production perspective and then we figured out for him the most important part for unreal engine was let's it's C++, it's open, I can tinker with everything I want, I can change the engine the way I want. No other engine has that on the market. And it's a complete suit, so we can release on that for sure. Uh, and if we run in any trouble, we will fix it. We can brute force it if, if needed, because we have access to everything we need. So that was his, his point of view. My point of view was like, oh cool, everybody we hire uh, can work in the engine instead of like doing paperwork, Excel tables, whatever. No, you don't have to do Excel tables. He, he does data tables directly in the engine. So um, we could even get new people into the development who might not have like the full understanding of everything, but they, they could all work. So we shipped the game with nine people in two and a half years. And everybody, even the, we, we, later we had some interns, they could work inside the engine all the time. So this both views reflect a little bit. I think we made already a good decision from the start with us both complementary in many, many ways, and then grow the company from there. Well, to, to pick up on something you said, uh, that you know, you you were co-workers and you respected each other, but you weren't necessarily best friends. I started a company with friends, and that can be a rocky road. I mean, I'm still friends with all of those people, but when you're making a game together, it's it's intense, it's hard, and you're going to disagree on stuff. And if you have an emotional relationship on top of your business relationship, it can get complicated. So it's just a thing to be clear-eyed about when you go in, that everybody has to know their role. And if a person in a specific role is making a decision within that role, you can say, I disagree. But you also have to put your friendship aside and go, we're a team making a thing. We are not a bunch of friends having a massive adventure. We are making a thing and we need to take it seriously. Yeah, there's definitely a maturity com component there, right? Uh, it's just kind of going in and knowing that whatever, you, whenever you step in that door or like that, in this case, the virtual door, that this is the office and whatever you say is not personal, right? Because um, teams get broken up so easily just by little small things that are inconsequential to the rest of the team, right? The business, the game, because it's not just two people, it's potentially everyone around you. It's not just the developers yourself, it's uh, um, their partners, their family, children, stuff like that. So um, putting aside differences and working together for the benefit of the whole community around you um, is a big thing. And it sets a good precedent for your local uh, game dev community too. So something to uh, feel good about if you're, you know, looking at some of these indie darlings that we, you know, we've seen come out and it seems like it's only one person who's produced them, right? There's always one person in the high, um, in the spotlight, you know, it's pretty much, yes, while the game might have been originated by one person, the final product was definitely, or most certainly, I should say, touched by more fingers than, um, than just theirs. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's a thing. And you have to know, there's there's very rare people out there where one pe one 
one folk, one person can do it all. There's, there's really, I could name some, which I appreciate a lot, um, but that's really, really rare. And very often if you see an indie darling and you're saying like, oh my God, this is the first games I did. This is great. When you look at the buyer, buyers of them, very often there's a lot um, uh, um, uh, experience combined. Um, so that's uh, that's uh, that's one thing. And um, when I said we started with two and grow to nine, that was something for us that that we knew that we knew the budget we were having. We knew how long we can work on that. We knew how many people we can have, and we know a little bit like. We need at least half of the company being experienced and the other half life, like, like let's get new people in also to have fresh blood, have different views um, and help help uh, that grow. So um, you should know that a little bit upfront what you want to do and what you can do, because that makes a decision e that, that drives the decision how much you can do or what kind of game you do. So if you start alone and saying, let's do... Um, <laughs> the classic one, let's do an MMO uh, and I do it alone. And everybody will laugh now because this is all what we have heard so many times. Um, and that's because of the perception, like making games uh, uh, can't be too hard. Um, or have you heard like a thousand times this, this thing that is like, ooh, I have this idea, you know, that everybody Yeah, but I can't tell you you have to you. sign an NDA but because it's the best idea like ever and we will all get rich. It's like, do around the world and do that also. Uh, every idea has already been done. The Simpsons have done it, you know? So it's really difficult to come out with something completely original. And the only way you have to show it is to actually make something and show it. Just like lose, you know, the, the don't be afraid. Just go and, and do it. Um, the originality is going to come out out of the way you do things. How do you... Um, turn them into a reality. Um, anybody can have an idea. That's <laughs> so, that's the thing. I in the past I was always thinking like, oh, we have to have great ideas, and then you are breathing over ideas, and you're breathing, and you're discussing before you touch anything. Nowadays, the last game jam I did, I think we thought five minutes about the ideas, and we started making it. At the end, it was completely different, but the real cool stuff came in when you <laughs> were rock working on it. It's so execution. I yeah. mean, yeah, game. Whatever you, I've re, I've been written a million design documents that no one reads because that's the fake. Nobody, game. nobody reads it's anything. Don't documents. take it personally. <laughs> sorry, sorry, indie devs. No one reads your docs. Uh, it's uh, true that the game mutates immensely. Whatever you release is not going to be the original idea, even if you're very close to the original idea. It's changed so much along the way, and that's the real journey. That's the adventure. And it's also a great place to go back to prior point to train up your new people and give them a little place to go, here, go explore this feature a little bit. Because I like to say I can turn anyone into an Unreal developer. You don't have to be an, a coder or a game designer or whatever. Give me a couple hours. I'll get you making something. And it really is that. You can do this. Here is a place to try and do this. It's a safe place. If you mess it up, it doesn't ruin the game. And turn your junior staff into people who can then be your senior staff. It doesn't staff. ruin your life. Sorry to add that, but it's kind of like now it's safer. You know, it's like you are not betting everything you have or all your money or all your resources into one thing, right? You can just go and try it. Try it out. Go and do it. Um, it's, it's nobody's going to be broke out of this. I right? mean, that, that's and the cool thing nowadays. Scrap it and start it again. <laughs> and you can do that. I. It, it's really funny. We are living in hard times and in easy times. So it, it shifted. So 10 years ago, it was extremely hard to get anything done. Now it's super easy to get anything done. Later days, it was easy if you have a finished game to get it on the shelf and get money for it. Now it's flooded and it is a, an art by itself to get recognized. So well, that's it's kind that's of like changed. I'm making games from Argentina, right? Like this is like around the corner from the end of the world. And it's never been more easy for teams to make games and never been more like competitive at the same time, sort of like what you were saying, Andy, right? Like um, now anybody can, can make something amazing. But that is great. I love that. So, I mean, my, my daughter comes from school and he, she used Scratch to do some, I don't know if you know that, that's a, that's a little kind of also note-based, so to say, uh, programming thing they use in school to to teach a little bit of algorithm. She comes home and I can show her blueprint and she she was like, she, she's now 20 something, but when she was younger, she could sit beside me and, and see it and say like, oh, this is cool. And she could basically 
grasp what what that is and that's what i like with games or another example is my my daughter so so i i'm really into learning from games so my daughter learned basically co coordinate systems not in school that was minecraft because she, she wanted to cheat and wanted to see where she spawns and she had to understand how how the 3d coordinate system works so this is great um so or vector in school that teach you like vector math and you are like oh, super boring and then you sit here and try to move a spaceship and you do vector math and so, so there's so much great stuff and that's so cool that game engines are now on the brink of like being so accessible that like everybody can do something it does get to the point though where you know we now that we can all do things and i personally believe that the roblox kids are going to revolutionize the game industry i think the kids coming in at roblox people doing creative mode in fortnite all that kind of stuff like there's just so much opportunities to learn how this works and then go make your idea but the hard part now is okay you've made a game how do you get it out how do you actually get it in front of people in a way that is more than just your mum and because my mom will look at everything I've made and go, that's nice. And, but, you know, I want people to play it. And so what is, and what do you have to do to get it out there, to get eyes on it and also put it in a condition where it can be played? I think that it's... leads us to one of the next questions that we had planned here, um, which is what, ha what did you do to prepare for your launch? Um, and when did you start uh, relative to the timeline of your project from beginning to end? Um, were there any important key strategies that you think that helped? Um, or was there any specific practices in the marketing that also helped with the visibility for your game's launch? And I do want to mention that we've had a couple of questions in chat in regards to how do you stand out in today's market? So first of all, it's not like making the game and then making marketing for it. I think you nowadays try to identify early what's cool on your game and what can be communicated. I can make an example, even with a lot of experience, I missed a lot of opportunities for the last game. So we used uh, NASA pictures to create nebulas because we were lazy. Uh, so we basically took the pictures. Um, and took the color coding and then created a particle effect that's recreating those pictures. Um, and that was a kind of nice nice thingy, but we didn't tell anybody. And then one evening I was sitting with a friend who is a journalist on a bigger German news magazine um, on a beer and we were talking about stuff. So it was not really an interview or something. It was just like people talking. And I t told him that and he said, oh my God, why didn't you tell us? I would have made an extra article about that because it's so cool. So to have someone from external in your team identifying what cool stuff and messages do you have is something I would advise to get early on because we are too close sometimes. And build a calendar from it. I think that is one of the things. Know when your release date is, know when you have to start selling the game or marketing the game, and really think about what dates do I need stuff. And you don't even need to know what the stuff is yet. It's like, I'm going to need screenshots and a video at this date because we want to get some attention. We're going to focus on this feature here, whatever. And just even if you don't stick to it, 100%, you have it in your schedule, so you don't have to stop doing what you're already doing 12 hours a day to then make marketing assets. You've gone, okay, I know I have to make marketing assets. And I know and that this store requires them in this format and this shape and all of that side of things, too. I remember and that the first time this I... as well. Sorry, go on, Martin. Oh, I remember the first time I spoke to a friend of mine um, that works in, in press, uh, especially for, for game, the gaming world, right? And I created this crazy long um, press kit and, and it was insane, the amount of information and stories and, and kind of like, he was like, you need to make this easier for me. <laughs> you know, like how many games, you know, uh, are being pitched to me, how many uh, press kits I'm getting from all over the world or demos to test, like, how uh, can you help me uh, with my job? <laughs> so it was kind of crazy to, to actually face that moment uh, where you need to, well, as, as you guys were saying, I need to uh, stay a little bit away from this, you know, step back and try to look it with, with different eyes. Um, the way you write things, it's, it's not just that you need someone in the actual language you're writing to proofread the text. It's also... 
um, how it's going to be used. So we understood that um, journalists kind of like needed to copy paste um, very specific parts of the text to make it easier for them to have quotes from the development team. Or um, if we were going to have um, people from the industry making recommendations or something like that, I don't know, we got... Uh, I remember Tim Schafer in, in our adventure game. So it was a, a big thing to have uh, someone like that um, supporting his, uh, this project. So it was kind of of interesting process to learn um, that there are like also different jobs that need to be fed with different kinds of information. Um, there is this dopresskit.com website created by Blambir and, and Rami Ismail uh, that was super helpful to kind of like understand what were the most important um, uh, key features that we needed to have, not only the screenshots, but even your profile picture. Like I remember uh, if you are not sending your own profile picture, people will find it online and they will always pick the most horrible one that is available to you. So uh, this is kind of like important. <laughs> Even if you don't but it's mind, really because... sometimes, as also Sam said, it's sometimes the basics. So before yeah. you begin to think about strategy, unique selling points, who you approach, um, I, I can also tell from, from evangelism perspective, sometimes we see something cool on Twitter and then it's extremely hard to find something out, which I don't get because there's no like, okay, this is our team name. This is the project we are doing. We are located here for us. Interesting do we use Unreal Engine or not? Um, so to so, so get the basics, some screen, screenshots. So even that on one, that's the reason why web pages are still helpful. So if someone is just on Facebook or just on Twitter or just on Instagram, that is not the right place, in my opinion, for ha having, having that. You want to be able to set, if someone shows interest, you won't have no friction giving him all the information he wants at once in the moment. Because sometimes you maybe meet someone who is in the position to help you. And if you then begin to like gather your information, then maybe the opportunity is gone. Or if it's like the most horrible thing I ever had was someone wanting to pitch. I was working for a publisher for some time as a scout. So I got a lot of those stuff in. And then there was one guy who was like, yeah, I cannot tell you much about the game. You're first to sign an NDA. That's already bad. Then you have the next guy saying, yeah, here's my information. Then you go to a website and then he sends you the password and then you download a zip file and that is also protected by a password. And then you have one screenshot in. You can assure that a lot of people don't, if you, if you are pitching your game, there is a lot out there. So you might have the best game ever, but if your information and what you're doing is not available, then you you might not get recognized on that level. And we are not talking about the, hey, let's do cool shit and let's try to, oh, shit. And it's... Oh, that's four, four times. <laughs> I'll take you anywhere. Strike three. <laughs> out. <laughs> no, no, no. Have to see if we... Yeah, I'm shutting up now. So it, it is true, yeah. though. It's like, I mean, as an evangelist, like we spend a lot of time just look, being out there in the world looking for stuff. And also on the other side, when we were making a drift, for example, we got a lot of support from Epic because we reached out to Epic and said, hey, we're using UE4 to do cool stuff. Are you interested? And they gave us, you know, it was like, kind of what I do now. We would go, oh, we're stuck. We can't get the engine to do this. So we're having this issue or, you know, how does subtitling work, whatever. And suddenly we had a whole bunch of people who could be like, oh, it works like this. Oh, we're going to send a team out to work with you to help you optimize, all that kind of stuff. And it really helped us make a stronger game because we had support and we were willing to go, hi, we're doing a cool thing. Here are all our details. We have a website, we have a demo, we have everything you need. But oh, and I think the other thing to remember is five, 10 minutes is a lot of people's time. And it's like one of those things whenever I see a trailer for a game, if your first minute is logos for things, then you've lost like 70% of the people watching your trailer by the time you get to your awesome game footage. Show me your awesome game footage. That's what I want to see. Two seconds. Two, two seconds. Two seconds. Yep. It's the if, I, if, yeah. You I think with seconds. TikTok, it's even less, right? Yeah, it might be <laughs> on some platforms, mm. but I think if you're um, game publisher, two seconds. Twitter, it, that that's what how much you have. And if we're sort of all we're seeing is a slow fading logo, gonna keep moving, right? <laughs> like it's 
yeah, two seconds. If you can immediately, you know, the first millisecond you're showing footage of the game and that is, you know, put the most interesting thing you have right th right then and there. You, you want to catch folks' attention immediately because our attention spans in today's social media environment and what we do and the amount of games that are out there is shorter than it's ever been before. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to shoot like thousands of information the first seconds. No. So that's the thing. So you, we all get the feeling like bam, 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 bam. We have to be super fast, but that's not it. I mean, you can view. There are beautiful trailers out there where you begin to scroll and then you see an opening scene that is like calm and nice and beautiful, and then you stick to it already. So we are not talking about like try to squeeze all your information in the first two seconds, oh, God, then you are doomed. Um, yeah, so more a PowerPoint presentation, but yeah, get my attention with your cool idea and beautiful presentation that makes me go i want to know what that is i don't even care what it is but i want to know and that's the that's same something. when you approach publishers so there were some questions i saw running through so how About do pitching, i approach yeah. a publisher and pitching that's exactly the same so instead of sending a presentation with 20 slides about something it's first what you want to do is get their attention so maybe a nice gif and just two or three sentences about that and then saying, here's a link to more information. That's much wiser because then he's, it's, it's the same. So he's scrolling through and then seeing like, oh, this GIF looks nice. So something, I mean, that's the thing. Text is the worst way to communicate anything. Uh, so the question is, how can you get as close as possible to the real experience? And that's moving pictures. So what is the, the one that's taking less friction and it's maybe a gif or gif or whatever country you're from and calling it strangely um so th that that's a that's a good vehicle to, to to do something maybe it's a small video maybe it's but that's much better than than like written written long text about the opening of your impressive story lore uh, you you have there no one cares about your law i say this as a former law master i ran the fiction for the command and conquer universe no one cares the fans no, care, they do care a lot, but that is not the people who are funding your game. It's a visual medium. And so mm -hmm. ultimately what the player or the viewer will be consuming is in most cases visuals. I know that Bose did a really cool audio only sort of game jam and they have those AR uh, audio only, but 99.9% .9 of the time it's, it's a visual medium, right? And so that's the way we'll ultimately consume it. And so catch our eyes, you know? So that two seconds, we want to see something pretty, or at least uh, not necessarily pretty, but interesting. The dream. And, and if you're... that information to who you are talking to, right? It's not the same if you are pitching to a publisher or if you are pitching to a, a partner, you know, like you are, I don't know, uh, going to, to work with someone as a co-producer for your project to help you achieve something. Or if you are talking well with the press, we already discussed that. Or, or if you are even talking with your, your community, your players, you know, like... Um, uh, I remember there was a, a lot of people that, uh, you know, can can actually, you know, two days before they launch, they can go to Twitter and announce something like, well, I'm going to be releasing my new games in new game in, in two days. And because they have this trajectory and they're like famous indie devs or something like that, they, they can manage, you know, to, to be successful with a strategy like that. But um, in many other cases, and, and especially in, in my experience, building a community in time, you know, like learning to engage with people that are people that love a genre, you know, that they just um, would kill to play your beta, you know, that, that they would just want to um, engage on, on the game level. It's a, a different discourse, you know, you, you need to learn how to manage that community and how to, to make it grow. Um, I remember when, when we wanted to make that point and click adventure that everybody told us that adventure games were dead and nobody wanted to, to finance uh four years after that we said like well let's wrap it up and let's make a kickstarter campaign and just launch it and 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 at least try to um close this uh project you know in a, in a nice way and the community went crazy like it was a group of people that actually moved others to come to us to help us. It was really an, a moving experience, right? To, to see um, the commitment of, of people that it's so far away and, and we've never met in, in our lives. 
Uh, so I think it was one of our best strategies uh, that wasn't plan <laughs> you know like we thought like yes let's make an, a kickstarter and then it turned out to to actually build us um a, a community that later helped us work with Koch media with deep silver you know like actually uh, making all that noise in social network and and getting this uh, the, the, these people from the adventure community supporting it kind of like opened us opened us another opportunity with uh with could have never had before that. Yeah, building your community and having champions in that community to help drive, because I see so many developers these days are starting up little Discord servers for their own games and um, getting moderators on there to just keep people active, just keep them coming back and having that game in the forefront of their mind at all times, right? Because an indie developer can't do it all themselves, right? And half the time, we're not marketers, we're not community managers, and having those people who know how to do that and just, like, cultivate that community and keep them around and engaged are uh, a dime a dozen. And when you find them, hold on for dear life. <laughs> um, one tiny comment. Uh, you know, Indie Week uh, is the first time we are doing this. This is really so exciting. Um, we, we are a lot of people in the evangelism team. We are all around the world. You can find us uh, in every continent, uh, actually. So <laughs> I'm actually very proud of, of being a part of this team. And for the first time, we created this event where each day we are featuring uh, indie developers around the world. They are sharing their experience. And um, actually, tomorrow on Friday, we will be sharing uh, the point of view of several um, uh, indie devs that are actually going to be talking about uh, to self-publish or not. Uh, if you are publishing with someone, how are you going to pitch this? Like uh, on Tuesday, we had uh, a special day uh, for looking for funding, you know. So it was also pitching, but for other kind of people, right? We were talking on how to organize your discord when we are talk talking with different people. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting if you go back uh, to the Unreal uh, website and check those out because it's, it's a lot of hard work from a lot of people and a lot of amazing teams that uh, everybody had the weirdest experiences and one more different than the other. So um, I think you can expand more about pitching and, and that on those, on those blog posts. Uh, Antarctica evangelist, by the way, the, the one who's swearing the most on, st st on stream has to do it. So I'm, I'm afraid that's where I moved to. I'll next join you. Week. Always wanted to go. <laughs> on the topic, I was hoping we could hear potentially if you if you're able to talk about a specific anecdote from um, when you did pitch a game um, to anyone, whether that was a publisher, a partner, trying to get someone to work with. Just a little bit curious about. Um, a, a specific instance of when you might have gone through that process and what that entailed? Um, I could probably start on that because my one was a more of a maturity one because I was young and I was dumb. Um, and one thing is, is that uh, I got word from a friend that one of the Sony reps, so it wasn't exactly a pitch to a publisher, but it was a pitch to a platform, right? And so there was a Sony rep on the floor of PAX Australia in about 2014, and I heard about him and only got word of it. Um, and I kept my eyes out and stuff like that and eventually found him and kind of like cornered him. And it was the end of the long day and I didn't think about like what he may have been thinking at that point because usually these reps have been walking around a conference hall for all day, they're just tired, they just want to go home, they've probably jumped off a flight where they're jet lagged and they're just sick of talking to people, right? Um, so just cornering him was not the best approach. Um, and sometimes I've found that it's actually like the best way is to just go, hey, I'm Alex. If you want to have a chat, here's my card. And then just let them be or um, or uh, let it naturally come. Because what happened eventually was the next day he came around to the booth and he was like, oh, hey, Alex, I saw you yesterday because I realized halfway through the pitch that I was like, I'll just leave you be. And he appreciated it. So having a bit of humanity actually went a super far away because he came by the pitch and he went, actually, this is quite cool because we had the Oculus and this was before um, uh, the PSVR or what was it called, Victor, before PSVR? Morpheus. Morpheus. That's the one. Yeah. Um, and he was like, well, we might have an opportunity here. So sometimes... Like, 
if you just show a little bit of humanity and um, approach us, uh, a pitch that way, it might turn out, but not always. So sometimes you have to go in with your best foot forward, show off your game. As we've already said, like have a pitch ready and for the appropriate party because platform holders want to hear why it's good for their platform. Uh, publishers, they want to hear how they're going to make their money back. Um, the people on the floor, like the consumers, are going to hear what's cool about my game and tell me in five seconds before I go to the next folk down the hall, right? Um, so you definitely, when you start doing your pitches, just practice on friends and family. Go to game dev events and pitch there. Um, Meet test up. different avenues. Meetups, yeah. And uh, because on that will... note... Sorry, go, Victor. just wanted to go ahead, since of the fact that there are there are no you know conventions happening right now i would just want to say that this applies to virtual meetups as well um and virtual meetings with folks and i know all of you on the call here can definitely sort of vouch for that you've just taken the job that used to be a lot more in person and it is now done online in a virtual space just like this right and so this applies if you're feeling a little sad about not being able to go to gdc which i know all of us are um yeah please go ahead and continue uh, something else um, that you can uh, consider that that is, I think it comes uh, from what Alex was saying. It's um, these are people, right? <laughs> you are engaging. I mean, if you want to talk to us, for example, uh, we can help you put together a presentation for applying to a mega grant, right? Um, and it's kind of like we are human beings. Uh, we are working for someone. Um, uh, you kind of like want us on your team uh if if we uh are going to to help internally you know like or or if i'm a publisher or i'm working with the hardware i'm probably part of a team i i have to uh talk about you like try and make it easier for me to champion you inside of the company um so i think that the best projects we we ever got either funding or publishing or any kind of deal out of it was when we found someone that fell in love with our project, but also at the same time, kind of like um, really wanted to work with us. Uh, imagine that that developing games is not just a one month thing. It's a long process. It's people that are going to spend a lot of time with you. So they really want to work with you. Um, it's um, it's it's kind of like a, a big part of of the deal to to build that relationship and that trust uh, between your team and this person that is going to be uh, putting their reputation on the line with their uh, partners in their companies, right? This is going to be your knight in shining armor, right? So it's kind of crazy to see how that those dynamics works. I think that the best projects we ever partnered with with someone was when when we find someone that actually was pitching to us you know like they were kind of like telling us uh how to make the pitch better because he needed this or that to present this on a meeting uh, i don't know like after gdc or they um were asking us to polish something on the prototype because they wanted um to to showcase it in a specific way i don't know i think it's it's crazy that we kind of like clicked with someone that knew better than than we did what we were doing. So they were kind of like, I don't know, uh, we were making a um, turn-based strategy RPG. So he launched uh, many of these games in the past and he wanted to work in another one. And he got like so excited that he was kind of like, well, you need to do this and then do this other thing. And don't worry, I, I you know, like I'll help you put this together. Um, or I don't know, when you're talking about business decision, you know, you, your game, uh, if it, it's a premium game or if it has content uh, like in DLC installments or if it's um, uh, free to play, sometimes and most of the times we are focusing on the game and we don't have that part of the game development process in mind. So having someone that actually has that experience of working in a live game, um, or generating content or kind of like, um, you know, like like maintaining a community around that. It was amazing to have someone that could guide us through that process. And and I think that the best uh, partners are the ones that, yes, complement you. Yeah, that's the thing. They complete partners. you, actually. 
that that's the thing you go for looking for a partner so i think one thing when you do your own game and you are like desperate because you maybe need money or you need help or whatever mainly it's money uh you need money so so you always go in this discussion with this kind of feeling like you are the small guy and there's the big guy and you have to show something but that's not true it's if you find someone where it fits then it fits also for them which means they have also benefit of that and that's not just like if there's someone who just wants to give you money to get money back then maybe that's not the right one for you so maybe you want to find something like martina said where it clicks so you should approach this kind of discussions like eye on eye even if it's a super big conglomerate of they have a lot of money whatever you are entering this and you have something to offer you have to offer your unique nice game so that's one thing second thing i would say is when you make your homework and that has not to do with the with the event itself if you would go to an event you should do your homework before you go to the event and make a list of with whom do i want to talk and then you have to realize a little bit what the companies are so if you are in europe and you go to sony japan and you talk to the guy he might not be even to help you at all because it's completely different branch they are disconnected to a certain level so you need to find someone that fits you then you maybe have to find someone do your homework and find out okay i'm doing this kind of game who else has knowledge about this game so not just fight firing to like everybody like shotgun going there and 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 pitch to everyone find maybe the one where, like where you can mode, learn from. Not like knows. Yuna Bomba, right? Like, just, yeah, find, yeah. It's like, you know, finding the, if you're pitching to Epic, you know, finding the right person to go through, like where, what region are you in? Like we're evangelists from different regions. Who should you talk to? So, you know, you talk to me, but you're in Australia. That's less useful, right? Uh, but, you know, it's a, I had a little, I had a story about this, which is about confidence in your partner, which was when we were making a drift, uh, we had a meeting with some very high up people from Oculus and they were like game developers with a lot of experience who'd made some cool stuff. And so we were all a little, yeah, are we going to look like, we're going to look silly. Uh, are they going to come in and just tear apart our game? And so we were in the middle of taking them through our work and they, the lead person said, no, I have a hundred percent confidence in your ability to execute the game. I'm just here to help you do it. And it really helped. And it was one of those ones where, yes, they helped us beyond that, but it gave us the sense that, yeah, we do know what we're doing. And so if you can find a partner like that who says that and means it, you know, hold on to them for dear life. It's And if you're in a position where maybe later in your career you were in the other role, being that person as opposed to being that powerful, intimidating person, but being a human and going, I am a human, I am here to help you, versus, you know, I am a corporate monolith really helps. I yeah, I was more on the other side than on really pitching. I just realized I was thinking about what other interesting pitching situations I had. And I, I, I have to say, I was really, really, really lucky on being in the right moment, in the right position. Um, and a lot of those easier pitches, so when we did Long Journey Home, we did with someone together, I didn't pitch the game, I pitched the team. So I said, this is a team that will work on that. This is maybe the kind of game we want to do most of the time, especially when you look for a little bit more money than just hand money for a game, it is not the investment they do for the project. It's the investment for the people you do. So it comes down to who you are and what you do. And that actually takes a bit of time and you have to do baby steps to like, you have to establish the relationships. So when, when we did the long journey home pitch, it was more like, it is really ridiculous, but we were sitting there like, shouldn't we make a game together? Yeah, that would be cool. So we drank a beer and decided, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. And then we talked about with whom, and then then it just unfolded and it felt it is an absolutely privileged situation to be there, but the relationships with all the people that were on board for that were built up over 15 years. So um, that that's the thing. So it takes sometimes a little bit of time. So when you do your prototype, then maybe it's already... A, an, an idea to begin to reach out to because building this kind of relationships takes time. Um, and, and on the other side, if you have someone where you have the feeling it's like not on the same level of discussion and it feels like a little bit like intimidating, then maybe don't go there. I, I really think this is a wrong, that is, that starts already pretty wrong. So it should start like, Hey, let, when people pitch to me, 
I always were extremely honest. So if someone started and like like talking after one minute, I got already, this is not for me. I don't want to waste their time. I don't want to waste my time. So I'm extremely honest in saying this is, I always try to see something positive and try to help the people to get where they want to be. But I'm also very clear saying, okay, this doesn't really fit. So, and, and some, and if you, if you have someone in front of you who doesn't get it, that's the human part. Like he's keeping talking and firing all the information and you try carefully not to hurt his feelings, but saying to him, this is the wrong place. This is the wrong approach. This is the wrong person you're talking to. So you have to listen and you have to find this kind of good balance. And sometimes it clicks and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, hustle culture can be damaging where there's a certain kind of tech mentality where you go, you hustle and you get out there and you work the pavement. And sometimes that drives people away. It's like you got to target your pitches. If you just shoot it at everybody, then everyone's like, oh, did you get that pitch? Yeah, I got that pitch too. Everybody's heard about it. Not oh, yeah. And that happens. I can tell you. <laughs> I was on the pitching side and I was in it, in Switzerland and at Ludicious. Really, really nice event. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't happen anymore. Ludicious, really, really nice. And I remember we were sitting in a really nice, cozy restaurant suddenly with all the scouts from all different companies there. And sure, you talk. So, it, and it was even like, I saw something that's not for us, but it's maybe for you. So as indie developers should talk to each other and finding out what kind of publishers or investors are nice, they do to a certain extent as well. So yeah, it is, it is important to find a good, to, to find a good, like sweet spot for you. Thank you. Um, something I was also wanted to, to add, um, it's kind of like crazy sometimes like how like how cultural things um affect also those those meetings um i'm latina i talk a lot uh, and it was really hard for me to to learn to listen like um i think that that one thing that actually opened us a lot of opportunities was that uh as, as andy was saying it was kind of like well this is our team and we were showing something we really wanted to do um, and showing those games actually showed how we could work if we were like completely free. So it was interesting that uh, instead of, you know, like if Andy would have said to me like, well, Martina, like after a minute, I already know this is not a, a project for me. Um, then it was kind of like a way of uh, for me to not just get offended and leave or something. Uh, I had to learn to say like, well, okay, and, and tell me more, like what kind of projects are you looking for? Or, um, and what kind of uh, yep. other projects we are engaging. So it actually opened us a lot of opportunities because we were showing that we have the capabilities, you know, we have the resources, we have the experience. Um, so maybe it was kind of like, well, can we pitch, you know, like something new? Um, so maybe it got a bit uh, <laughs> spread uh, our attention, but actually opened us a lot of opportunities to at least keep surviving, right? So... I mean, um, even have this intel and getting an idea about, oh, this is what they're looking for and getting, you get, you can get a lot of information out of that. So what you can ask why they are looking for that, et cetera. So this can be still a very fruitful discussion. Um, and maybe and then, you're uh, another, another tiny note, like consider the actual culture from the other person. So I was warned <laughs> by a friend of mine when I was going to meet with someone from Germany and uh, he told me like, well, now, Martina, you know, you are Latina. So consider this guy is from Germany and from the West. So it's kind of, it's going to be like even more German. Um, so maybe he won't express many emotions, right, Andy? <laughs> no, you were not talking about me. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Or, or for example, well, when we met with the people from Square Enix, um, this was a, um, a Japanese company um, Fukushima-san, the, the owner of the, the, the company, the, the founder himself was there and he had um, this project where he wanted to make games like for Latinos, by Latinos, like Rio Grande Down, we are all Mexicans or something like that. I don't know what he had in mind, but it was kind of crazy that um, even though he wanted the Latino way, he was expecting us to understand the Japanese way of doing things. So I think that one of the reasons we got the project was that we got prepared for that meeting uh, and not only in the ceremony of what a Japanese meeting means, 
uh, but then also on how to follow up or how to um, have this, these conversations with, with people um, that are kind of like expecting uh, things to be on, on a, certain, a certain way, right? Considering cultures is kind of something that's, that's, that you should consider. So getting a feeling, I mean, we are operating now on a worldwide um, audience, so to say. So, I mean, 10 years ago, you could be successful by having, um, by having the, the pipeline to produce the CDs and put them in a shelf with a nice box. So that was the value. So that's where some publishers come from. So they had this kind of uh, chain, the production chain under their control. Um, and then you could be successful in one market. Now we are aiming like everybody is kind of aiming globally. Some are aiming only for the local market, et cetera. But you have to find that out and to 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 find, I, I, I think, to, to, to think a little bit about culture with who you talk about, but also what is your cultural uh, goal of the game? So who's the target audience? What is the, what is their culture? And that, 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 and it's super interesting. I mean, it's super interesting to, to, to find out. And that's why, yeah, that, that, I think that's something to consider. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember when I released uh, my first game to early access, um, it was a little horror game. And we were like, oh, for the most part, we're probably going to get most of our players from the US and Australia and the UK, right? The usual Western countries. But we were super surprised when Poland was our top like country, right? Because like you wouldn't expect, oh, Poland being in dark areas and all that stuff, liking dark horror style games. And it just never occurred to us. So we pivoted, pivoted quite a lot. So we like for marketing, we started chatting to more Polish like um, journalists and stuff like that and it was just like it was weird but you have to roll with the punches right otherwise you sink or swim oh uh, yes this industry is you know not it. who punches harder is who can take more punches i think that's yeah. a, a tip well, for everybody out there so i my last studio before here we were making a game in a different engine that targeted uh, women and queer people primarily we were making story games and we wanted to do sort of prestige like a prestige version of like a choices style game and it was really interesting because suddenly your market outreach is completely different your cultural sensitivities are completely different and it was one of those things where we were looking at the content we were making and we didn't necessarily, while our team was very diverse, our writing staff was not so much. And we realized that we were making content targeting people that was excellent content, but wasn't necessarily actually hitting the cultural beats we wanted. And it is a really interesting challenge where you're like, you need to have, but we had community people, we had marketing people who had real knowledge of those markets. And they were the ones going, helping us steer the conversation and steer the creativity of our work. So actually targeted the people we wanted, because we found the ones that didn't hit those marks did not do well. Because yeah, someone look at that and go, I don't want that. I want that. And it's as simple as that often. But yeah. I think it's time to move over to some of the questions that we received from chat. Some of them I know we have covered a little bit already, but there are a couple there that I think are worth addressing. Um, let's start off with a couple where I'm sort of looking for a one sentence, one word answer, uh, trying to be pretty straightforward about it, because I know that we can talk a lot about these topics um, individually, but let, let's try to so that we can go through them um, a, a little bit. Um, Hillel Garcia Austria asked, how can I protect my game from piracy? <laughs> Not at all. You can. <laughs> the um, question is if you want to take that fight. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say if there is a bad pirated version of your game up on a torrent, upload a good version of the game with a good build. I don't know if that, oh, your publisher would like that, but that's the reality. You don't want a bad version of the game out there, even if it's pirated. But yeah, pirated. actually, I like one marketing tactic uh, of another team. I can't remember the name, but they replaced the main character with a character with a pirate hat. And so it made it a novelty, right? Um, and that was a marketing scheme for them. So you could potentially lean into it because yes, um, pirates are probably going to pirate the game anyway, right? It's not yeah. it's not money you are losing. It's kind of like these people maybe can have don't have the money to spend it on your game. So it's it's better if if you get uh, good advertising out of it. So uh, yeah, mouth it to mouth, also... I, think, I think it's still the like the biggest um, way to to make your game successful. Yeah, it could also mean that. Um, 
maybe Steam's auto um, pricing measures weren't appropriate for a certain region, right? And maybe a certain region needs it to be just a little bit cheaper. So if you look at your data, you might find that, oh, I'll just drop my price in this region and they're more likely to stop pirating your game and just buy it because it's more about what I can afford, what I can put aside now, maybe even a discount every now and then at a, an appropriate time can help as well. So That's really good, yeah. especially in Latin America. Like um, we, we always have this kind of strategies to, to have uh, a, a better pricing um, because it's so expensive for us. And at the same time, you know, we always have additional taxes and stuff like that. So I think this is the best. You can always ask, hey, why are you pirating my game? And they'll probably tell you. I mean, that's the thing is, again, it's humans like anyone else. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I really think it is a question how much effort you want to put into it. And I'm pretty sure you don't want to fight the thousands of people who are really skilled in breaking your game anyhow. So especially an indie developer, I think that's not where you want to waste your time with this. Uh, make a cool game and then be happy if it's pirated a lot and then the next game <laughs> maybe runs better or whatever. But I think to go on that battlefield, it's uh, you, will, you will die several times uh, even before you get only one foot forward. And so yeah, and get a lot of negative press from using anti-piracy stuff because some people get real mad about that. I mean, yeah. And it's, it's really interesting. I, I play a lot of old games and try to get them work. And I have a big library of pretty old games here. And even now, I tend to buy it on GOG because it is so easy and convenient and I don't have to do anything. So if you if you make it accessible enough and easy enough to buy and if it, the price fits for the um, for the country, etc., then that lowers your private uh, piracy more. And what I really this is really interesting because the games from the around 2000 that really released around 2000 that had all the secret ROM and all that they were a big initiative on a lot of bigger companies uh, who were putting uh, protections on them. You can't play them nowadays anymore <laughs> because Windows 10, for example, is seeing some of them like like secret ROM as a um, uh, as as a security virus. issue, so so you cannot play those games anymore, um, and I think it didn't protect them from privacy. So it it it's just it's just awful. So I wouldn't go there and fight that fight. Well, in Latin America, we used to have this problem where every time uh, we had to to uh, yes wait for the release of a game, you know the the time difference between the official launch and the launch in a Latin country was like so long; it was ridiculous. Um, that people would just uh, pirate it and start playing. Like a lot of Latinos, we speak English because we've been playing games from other regions that weren't localized in, in Latin Spanish, right? Um, so it was kind of crazy that we had these, um, uh, like, st not stores, but, I don't know, um, people on in parks, you know, like sell, sell, uh, selling us uh, these copies, uh, illegal copies of games. But then when the digital distribution came and... It was like so much easier than instead of taking a bus, going to a park, trying to find the game you want, bringing it home and, and see if it works or not, you know, like just downloading a version um, uh, at home. I don't know, it, it made it just easier. And that helped so much uh, to, to fight piracy in, in our region. Um, and this, and this, uh, the same thing, right? Like we got games localized in our own language with a special prize from our special region uh, launched at the same time as everybody else, right? So we don't need to pirate it. We now can access it uh, as everybody else does. On that topic, next question comes from Blah Blue, um, who's asking, is getting a lawyer that important in indie game dev? And uh, <laughs> I love all the details, but let's try to keep the answers to a sentence or two most. Yes, get a lawyer, get someone who can read legal contracts and explain them to you and make sure that, if nothing else, to make sure that all the content in your game you actually own and are legally allowed to release. Because you can get you can get DMCA'd for the music you used. You could find out they used marketplace assets that weren't necessarily allowed to be released in modified form. There's all kinds of things you could get into. Get a lawyer to review all that stuff. It's incredibly important. And you don't and want to sign a lawyer contract for contracts. Back. Yes. A lawyer for contracts as well. Um, like I know a lot of indie devs who they jump in and they just do a handshake agreement, right? 
But officially, a handshake agreement doesn't mean that the rights of assets get transferred to you. It still is especially, in their hands, right? Um, especially so oh, having, contract. Oh, sorry, Alex. Yeah, so having a contract that seals the deal that says, hey, the rights of this asset is going to be transferred into this company's hands of the game um, is super important. Especially, um, I've seen uh, companies have uh, disputes in the middle of a game, right? Because, oh, you're using my asset and it's used in a way I don't like it. And because they had a handshake agreement, it's had to be removed, right? So just be aware of that. Next and topic. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Martina. I'll, I'll let you answer no, that. Question. That you need like someone that is specialized also in games and understand the game development process. Um, for, for me, the best lawyer we ever got was a Russian guy. And he kind of like told us like, well, you know, agreements are made to me to be are meant to be broken. So it's kind of like, well, you need someone to um, that understands the process. So when something doesn't go as planned because it's going to happen, and and it's not always bad. Sometimes it's like you, I don't know, find a new mechanic that makes your game amazing, and you want to pursue that. Well, like, how are you going to um, put that in in writing and and reorganize your your working schedule or whatever? So that's before my before you jump in with the next question. There's there's one question I saw just popping up, and I think that's something I completely get. As an indie dev, you might not have the money for a lawyer. That's your thinking. That's true. But on the other hand, you might sign something you are bind to, and if you don't understand what you're signing there, that will cost you much more. Um, and I can tell you, in my region at least, I know some lawyers who are really indie friendly and say like. I will check with you the contract and it, if it comes to a big deal, et cetera, et cetera, we will find a way that you get me paid. So th there are really nice people around that. Not all lawyers are shit. <laughs> oh, sh shit. So now I have to go oh, to I, I don't know. Right? <laughs> it's really hot here, so I'm happy to go to the... No, no seriously, the meetups and all, build your network locally because you will find an indie who's telling you, oh, we worked with this guy. He's mm -hmm. really nice and helpful, even if you don't have the money. Lawyer, accountant, key. And also, if you're hiring people, have a lawyer to review and set up your employment contracts. So when you hire people, the ownership rights and everything is sorted out. They're, you know, the standards work, all of that. Otherwise, it can get real messy. On that note, there are also the indie equivalent of lawyers as well as accountants. It might actually be worth reaching out in similar communities um, with folks that are in the same path of, or part of your career as you are in game development. They might be in their respective careers. So um, You can always talk to older indies uh, that we've been fucked up so many times that we can tell you like, well, this is a problem. <laughs> <Sweat drop. laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, Victor, perdón. Okay, I'm just gonna, you know, bleep bloop. Um, next question comes from, <clears throat> actually, there have been a few questions in regards to what does an evangelist do? And then there's a follow-up one that uh, 3Dev asked, um, which is, do you have to have a custom license to get help from Epic with an indie game? Um, so if you could please elaborate a little bit about the evangelist role and what folks can do to get in touch with you and what you, what you can do for them. Alex, would you like to take that one? <laughs> yeah, so um, the main rule of evangelism is to, I guess, uh, champion the community, kind of um, turn people into basically champions of our community, but also show off the engine and basically build. It's We're basically like glorified community managers, but with support and conferencing and all that stuff. So we go out, we do talks at conferences, uh, or used to, we do it now virtually. Um, and we chat to teams, so we might even do a little bit of solution architecting. Um, uh, depending on the evangelists in your region, you might be doing something a little bit different. Like I know uh, for Australia and New Zealand, we've got a little bit more of a building um, region for game dev because unfortunately when the global financial crisis happened, uh, it went all under. So now we've got a lot more indies, um, not as many AAA teams. So my role might be a little bit different to Andreas's. However, I still do the whole thing of Hey, let's talk at talks. Let's go to meetups. Let's help out the Lindy team. So I regularly have um, Twitter DMs and emails come in saying, hey, Alex, I've got a problem with the engine. Do you mind um, 
basically checking this out. And we're happy to do that. Um, within reason, right? Um, if you keep on hammering us, we'll probably just be like, uh, give us maybe a couple of days and we'll get back to you. But um, we're here to basically help people make cool, and I won't do the uh, the swear word, Andreas, you can fill out in, in for me, but <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're basically here to just help out. So With a friendly face of for developers at Epic. You know, that's what I say. You know, it's like my DMs are open on Twitter. If you've got a problem, hit me up. It says it right in my profile. Please do, because that's why we're here. Well, in my case, I'm more like um, like a social person, let's say. <laughs> so I, I've been like a professional stalker in my career for the last 15 years. So it's kind of like um, I know a lot of people and, and my main uh, job is kind of like being the first point of contact between you and all of the teams inside of Epic. So I maybe won't be able to assist you on a technical issue, at least know who to point you to, right? If you need to talk with the animation or the architecture team or someone from games or VR, um, or even, I don't know, I, I get to talk a lot with people from education. And, and even inside of our education team, we have like different teams, right? We have people that are working with um, authorized instructors or with training centers or with universities and academic partners. So kind of like my work, it's to be um, a human, uh, I don't know, like networking person, kind of like someone that will kind of like help you surf uh, our uh, our big community. Um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of like something I, I've been doing um, as a volunteer in the community for so long. I can't believe now I'm getting paid to do this. This, this is amazing. Um, so it's kind of like... Um, I am not making games, but I am helping others make their own game. And of course, make them with Unreal. Uh, our job is to turn you to the dark side, right? So uh, we are here to um, preach. How, how, was, how, how was that show going, Alex? Um, we are uh, spreading yeah, uh, Tim Sweeney's Spreading the world, yeah. The uh, <laughs> Lord and Savior, Tim Sweeney, right? <laughs> we sound like a cult, yes, but it's kind of like also what we do. Yeah, so and one thing is, is we come from um, mostly games backgrounds. Some of us actually come from virtual production backgrounds, enterprise, stuff like that. So we cover a wide gamut. Um, and like, for example, um, Sam and I, we do a lot of VR stuff and programming. Andy's done a lot of everything. Um, I know like Chris Murphy, you've probably seen, he's my counterpart in Australia. He does a lot of tech art. So uh, we are all have complementary roles. Yeah, so basically we are responsible for the outreach. So we want to get the word out and show how easy uh, it is to to do um, to use the engine. And we do that in in two directions. So internally, we are a little bit like, I'm, for example, making a very small game right now and reporting back to the engineers and saying, how is the experience there? Or we talk when we talk with, uh, with uh, indie developers, we get a lot of insight what what their stuff is um, sometimes we even help bigger studios uh, when when we used to travel uh, we visited regions and where meetups but also meeting um, different users of the engine from like a game stuff but enterprise stuff as well and then trying to get the information a little bit back so it's a two side thing and nowadays we help a lot with the feature videos and making cool projects and show how stuff is done and trying to distribute this information and help people um, getting into it and making cool stuff that's a cool thing epic is only succeeding if you are succeeding so i that's the reason why i love our business model so our job is to make cool stuff coming out. So this is really, this is the part I love most in this job. So we are trying to be helpful because if you release something, then we we just don't, it's not about selling a license or something like that. It's about like, it's it's not like here is, you pay for the, for, for, for the engine and then you do something and we forget about it. It's about like, hey, really, really cool stuff needs to come out and then everybody is happy and the ecosystem is growing. Yes, and, and also it's kind of like making you meet the others. We have this community that is so generous and so open. We have this uh, Discord channels and, and, and all these uh, places where people actually meet up and share their experience uh, and what they are doing. So it's actually amazing when you tell them like, well, have you checked out uh, that guy's game or what they are trying to um, use the engine for something we've never used it before. So it's kind of like amazing that we are also kind of like um, 
making these matches with with people that are maybe from completely different industries, right? And and have completely different experiences in in their lives, uh, so so they can create something completely new. It's really fun to visit the internal evangelist chat on a regular basis because there's always something cool there, either something pop popped up on Twitter or like someone did something internal that we're going to put out, but it's sort of, yeah, we're at the nexus of interesting stuff within the community, trying to manage it both ways. Yeah, one thing is, is for sure, we see a lot of cool stuff and a lot of interesting um, techniques and solutions to things. So um, we have a wealth of knowledge for um, some things that you may not have realized are in the engine, for example. Um, like I just showed off uh, before the stream um, a little tool menu, toolbar extension um, that I'll post up onto Twitter next week. Um, and uh, yeah, stuff like that. It's just, uh, it's really cool to be able to just go, hey, I'm just jumping in the engine and doing what I love and showing it off. And most of us potentially come from uh, meetup backgrounds as well. So I used to be the organizer of the Brisbane meetup in Australia here. Um, and yeah, I think the same was with Ari Unsborn. Um, and a couple of other people. So, To round that off, um, I just wanted to say that your first mes message to one of us should not be if you're allowed to ask a question. You should ask the question, and then we might be able to answer. I think the most frequent question I receive is, can I ask a question? And um, yeah. it can be tiring and sometimes a little difficult to res you know, just respond yes and sort of initiate the conversation. If we're unable to answer, um, you know, we, we won't or we will try to. Um, and so just ask the question right off the bat. That's the best way to get our attention and, and also the possibility for us to help. Um, but I also apologize if not all questions get always answered because I can tell you since the two and a half years I'm doing this now, it is just not possible to get back. I sometimes feel really bad about it because then I forgot that someone wrote me on Twitter DM. I forgot that happens. So don't feel feel bad if 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 it doesn't come back directly. Try again. Nobody of us is like pissed if you try two or three times. That's fine. It's I'll just say, try, like the try again is. to a certain extent. <laughs> <laughs> um. Next question, I want to dig into a little bit more um, specifics when it comes to uh, marketing and, and, and publishing, publishing and uploading your games and, and such. Um, Kenneth Verhoeven asked, how can you do marketing if you have literally zero budget? Uh, I'm making a game with my dad in my free time. Oh, I love that already. This is already a pretty cool story, to be honest. There are not so many people out there who can say I do a game with my dad. That is already a good marketing pitch, to be honest. And You're then already marketing it, actually. You're pitching it to so us. So right? already, that's already marketing with no budget because now I'm intrigued. Now I would like to know what kind of game you are doing. So this is already pretty cool uh, because it's unusual. It's kind of, it's nothing you see often. And that you that want to intrigue. Top, you know, as a story, you get 2,000 words out of it. Yeah, I'll yeah, say I'm, this I'm, locally. Locally, there was a team that had a whole family and that was their whole selling point is, hey, we're a family of game developers and we're making this cool game. Support us. And but, there's, but there's some basic stuff I think you can do. It's like you can post regularly, not like one day you post thousands of things and then one month you don't. You have to understand a little bit the algorithms of all this social media stuff that's out there. So you have to understand a little bit the platform. So you... You get better traction, for example, if you don't make external links. It's better to post on, on Twitter. And you can find this kind of information. So you can sit down and there are people who have blog posts about that. So you can figure that out. And then you make a plan for it. Like I do each uh, screenshot Saturday. It's really good uh, to get some, um, um, uh, some visibility. So there's a lot of those stuff. You can make a list of those. You can figure out what to do and then have a plan like each Friday evening, 9, 9 p.m., something like that, we post something with a little update what we do. And it takes time to grow it, but have consistency is 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 pretty, pretty important. I always forget with my own account. I forgot to post, and then I'm really disappointed by the next posting. I think, oh, this is a great one, but I forgot to post for four days. So in the algorithm, I'm not shown anymore. So you have to learn a little bit about the platforms, and you don't need money for that. 
and then you have to little bit of a plan and then you think about what kind of content uh, you want to do because it's also pretty hard to have consistent content and not like throwing everything you have uh, out there <laughs> you have to have some surprises at the end so it's like with the movie trailers you watch and you see oh all the fun jokes were in the trailer so the movie is not fun anymore so you also want to avoid that so you need to have a little bit of a strategy I have um, two uh, examples um, that I really like. There is this team that kind of like build their community is starting to market the development community. So instead of going to build uh, a player use, uh, user based uh, community, um, they started to share their experience on how they were developing their game. So it was the community around them, the people from the actual game gaming industry that was kind of like intrigued on how they solved that problem or how they are doing um, this or that. So you can actually start also sharing your experience with your own game. Uh, like make a video of your dad uh, making the game and then dads around the world could actually get into gaming because of that. Um, I don't know. I think it's um, it's something sometimes we don't think about. Um, and then the other thing is like uh, there are many... Um, like like the other teams, other industries with different backgrounds that uh, could actually be interested in in participating uh, as partners, you know, like getting something out of this. Um, we have this experience with the adventures of Doug Mendoza and Pizza Boy. It was, um, we were making a game uh, based on a comic book uh, published by Dark Horse Comics. And um, this, this animation studio, they wanted to, they were starting out and they wanted to have their own um, like portfolio uh, project, you know, something to show to potential clients. So they actually invested their own time and, and they didn't charge anything to make a very short um, VFX film. So this comic book, this specific comic book took place in uh, Lisbon, in Portugal. And the short film was uh, giant spiders invading Portugal and, you know, like crawling through um, this uh, bridge that it's fam famous in Lisbon. And the funny thing was that when we published that, uh, that, that video, nobody saw it um, when we expected it to be seen. But since one of the people that participated in this film, uh, in this short film, was the face of like the Portuguese CNN um, back, how can I explain this? But like, you know, something that wasn't supposed to be a part of, of our strategy turned out to be amazing because this guy that was an actual uh, serious journalist, you know, um, kind of like, allowed us to use his image to make uh, like the fake coverage of this invasion of spiders. So the, I don't know, the Portuguese Association of the Free Press or something went to every single media in Portugal to complain about how, you know, we were using his face for a stupid <laughs> short film uh, for a comic book and a video game promotion. And we got like 2 million views in an hour because of all of these people complaining about this specific. I don't know if I made any sense. Um, Victor's face is, it's kind of worrying me, but I, was I don't know. Sometimes, a face of 2 million. Yes, in a morning, you know, so it's, it's crazy how things uh, work out. Um, maybe they're talking good things about you or saying bad things, important if they're talking about you, right? <laughs> Preferably good things, I should say, is better than bad things. But there is such a thing as bad bad press. Um, this leads into a little bit um, from a question from, uh, let's see here. There have been so many now. I want to make sure I get the right name of who asked them. Um, Shipwreck Studios asked, and uh, let's do a, a short answer here. Um, might, might even answer this myself. As a new indie preparing a demo, what's the best way to grow an audience? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Twitch? And my answer to this question is as many as you can. There are services that allow you to post to several sites at once. Um, some of them might cost you a little bit of money, but that amount of money to pay someone or just your own time of being in the role and actually managing all of that each separately on each platform, that can be 
a lot more expensive. Um, but uh, how about, yeah, one of you can fill in a little bit about sort of suggestions in terms of, um, you know, how, how, how can you grow your audience? Depends on the game too. Like not every game lends itself necessarily to a Twitch stream or to YouTubing. Like it's one of the problems we had doing VR is obviously VR is experiential. And even a trailer doesn't really get it across. So a lot of our stuff, we were less leaning into that. We did trailers and YouTube videos and some stuff with Epic. Uh, but a lot of what we did was boots on the ground marketing where we were at places going, here, play this, and using that to drive word of mouth. And you know, it was one of those ones where you, you have to kind of pick which battle you need to fight for your game. And then later we found a lot of people did end up streaming the game on Twitch, but that was post-launch and was really useful for kind of long tail, but pre-launch, yeah, well, we weren't quite there yet. Thanks, Sam. Um, Bob's Not Your Uncle asked, at what point should you set up a store page, for example, on Steam? <laughs> I take that one. Um, early. Early, 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 as early as you can, even if it's a dummy one because you don't have to publish it to learn what you need to do because it's much more than you expect you have to do. Um, and that's true for all the stores. So, and they need special format, et cetera, et cetera. And you will need several iterations to make your artwork looking nice uh, on all the different um, views it has. So the recommendation is, in the moment you have this page, just make something. So it's the same with the game. Just make something, throw it in, get feedback internally, get feedback from others, uh, and iterate on, on it as you do with the game. Alex, I think you had a, another good time. Yeah, there is a little bit of a caveat. Um, and the only caveat is uh, if you already have a store page up, you potentially uh, ruin any chances of an exclusivity deal. So there is also that um, side of things. But uh, if you're already talking about exclusivity, you probably are already talking about putting a store up somewhere else, or um, you should already be thinking about these oh, things I, first up. Oh, only to clarify, I'm talking about not, not that you publish it. I'm just talking about um, on the back end, bringing everything in because you can preview it and show that even to others. Um, but on the other side, that's, that's true. true. Yeah, the store page shows a little bit of professionalism, right? Um, of having that there, it's a lot better than, you know, one or two paragraphs and like a, a locked web page or some of the other references that I've heard you talk uh, about for tonight. It can look really nice and professional. This is what the game will look like when you're, when you actually publish it. Um, good tips right there. Stark AVS asks, how fleshed out should a prototype be for me to start approaching finance options and marketing for the game? As a former professional rapid prototyper, uh, it really, again, I mean, it's a broad question, but you should be selling the dream of your game and you should be selling the vision of your game. Like you want to show up your core feature, the thing that makes you interesting and cool. It doesn't have to be look exactly right. Like we sold a drift off a, gate, off a build in a totally different engine that looked completely different. But the core concept was the same. The core principles that were driving the game were there and carried across. So that's what you need to focus on for your prototype. In three minutes, sell me your experience, sell me your vision. And I can accept that you don't have great animation or you don't have any VFX yet or whatever, as long as you sell me your core burning vision that you want me to be interested in. Thank you. Um, let's move on. Um, George Rivara asked, what percentage of budget should be for marketing? That's if, <laughs> if you have a budget. <laughs> uh... I don't know if this is true, but there is a, a myth that um, says that Will Smith, or I don't know, uh, Shim Carrey, uh, wouldn't sign on a movie that didn't have the half of the budget only assigned to marketing. <laughs> so uh, I don't know uh, for, for that question. You know, it's and like, that's that's properly true for like big games as well. So, so especially the big ones there, you can compare marketing budget with that, which means for an indie dev, if you have no money to make the game, you have no money to make marketing, which is a perfect fit. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. You can have like $500,000 worth of marketing, like, which is enough to, you know, make a small game. 
and still no one knows that you exist. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's how you deploy the marketing more than anything else. And one thing as well is uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that some platform holders uh, are exclusivity with uh, game stores before. Um, I'm not talking just about exclusivity like you can only deploy the game store. I'm talking about marketing exclusivity as well. So some platform holders actually say, if you only market your game on our platform, we will give you a bunch of marketing money. So that's always an avenue for indie devs. Um, that's something you might be able to broach to your platform holder if, you, uh, if you're nice enough. <laughs> but I mean, there are different, there are so many different routes of, I don't know. I have a friend. They made a game with two people with absolutely no money. They get a little bit of government funding. We are pretty happy in Germany that we have like the states and even the uh, national wide. You can get a little bit of a funding uh, for your games. They made that with that, and then they made a quirky game with a zombie in Unreal Engine with only two people. They released it. PewDiePie pay played it, and that's the story. Now they are six people studio, uh, and they're doing pretty well. Uh, they released the same. Um, and it was, they are actually, it's slugger flies. They are even in the, in the, in, they have an inspirational video for Monday, um, in the Indie Week. Um, this is pretty nice. Or there's Omno, uh, y Jonas uh, Manker. He is, uh, he's an animator. He learned Unreal Engine by himself. Uh, and then he, he had a small prototype and then he showed it around and people told him, you have to do something with that. And then he made a Kickstarter, which was a little bit easier when he did it uh, that was pretty successful then he found some marketing people helping him with with that and and now he's on his game in the last in the last leg so it's pro asks a good question here what strategy would you would you recommend to indie devs for quality assurance testing start early oh. <laughs> well that's I don't a good know one how to address that um but like it's kind of like sometimes I feel like people rather make a huge game because it has a lot of content and they think that that is going to what is going to make it successful that you have a thousand characters or I don't know um, millions of missions and worlds to uh, discover and the truth is that if it doesn't matter if you've created all that content if the game is not polished enough for people to get there you know so maybe if you can scope down try to do something that it's um, better. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. So if you can uh, do, you know, like spare some time yourself to do QA or to work with somebody else if you don't have the money uh, or the budget to to hire a professional one. Um, but try to to do that so you won't um, find ugly surprises when when you release the game. There's also um, automation. Um, so a big thing is is like. There's a big misconception with automation that, ah, oh, I'm going to have to set it up and keep it maintained. But you're trading the time off to implement automation and testing, or automated testing, I should say, in your game to save time not having to look for bugs later on, right? Um, so you catch them early, you catch them often, you basically spread out the work over time, right? Um, so automation testing, like especially in UE at the moment, there's some good tools in there like Gauntlet and the automation framework. Definitely check them out because uh, just spending a day or two just getting them set up and then each time you implement a new feature and build a map that just tests that feature. Or even if you're making a multiplayer game, you can re like record your multiplayer games, replay them and test the replay, right? Um, so if you know that a certain way you play a game is going to crash with that replay, you can just play the replay. And if it does not crash, sweet. That's your smoke test done, right? Uh, it's it. super powerful. Yeah. <laughs> I would also lean into things like early access. I mean, obviously not as the first step for QA, but especially if you're doing a game, like a uh, good example is Hades. Hades is winning all these Game of the Year awards. Hades spent a lot of time in early access refining its game model. And these are experienced devs who'd come from AAA and made a bunch of indie games. And they still went, okay, we need to find out everything. Not only are we doing a gameplay model that needs a bunch of tuning, but this it's, means that when you actually ship and you come out like a Nintendo Switch, you are very polished, you're very clean, because you will get more QA in one day of an audience playing your game than you will in like six months of a QA 
team playing your game, which is unfortunately not the ideal order of events, but it tends to be what happens. And setting up a crash reporting service helps as well in that regard, because uh, like, I mean, uh, Fortnite is a good example of that is uh, millions of people play that game and the engine is pretty damn stable at runtime for that reason. It's because you've got millions of people basically putting it through its paces on thousands of different devices, right? And you can't do that in an indie studio. Uh, you can only do that when you get the masses jumping onto it. So, yeah. It's easier to find a large player base than it is to find the money to fund a large QA portion for your game. Next question comes from Duder Seb, and this one is, uh, he says, question prim primarily for Martina. Uh, when do you think is a good time in a project to incorporate? Sorry, to incorporate what? Uh, to incorporate as a company, to go from oh, I'm okay. just making a Sorry. game to now we're an actual company. Okay, so um, this is kind of tricky because sometimes, uh, you know, incorporating means that you are going to start to work as a company. You know, there are a lot of, um, uh, it's not business related, but it's kind of like, taxing and uh, all these matters that you have to do to start working as a company. So um, sometimes you need to evaluate what is it that you are doing? Is it um, you are planning to hire a lot of people? Do you need to uh, incorporate because you want to um, bring people to work in an office, for example? So you will have to hire insurance and stuff like that. Um, are you uh, planning to develop something solo and you want to publish it on your own? Um, do you really need to st start uh, paying taxes as if you were, you know, a, um, a big company? Um, I think that when we started with the studio in 2009, I think it was, uh, we made that mistake. We went corporate too fast. I don't know how to tell it. Um, so it was kind of crazy that we needed to make presentations every month and we needed to have meetings with accountants and we weren't even, we weren't even hiring no one. We weren't making any money, um, so it was kind of like a lot of money down the drain and a lot of time because we needed to actually spend time to maintain that um, that part of the company. So something that I would also advise is that if you really think that you need to um, start working in, in this way as a company, as a corporation, um, try to find someone in your team or a partner that loves to handle that, you know, because uh, it has nothing to do with games, but at the same time, without it, it's not going to exist, you know, the games part without it. So it's kind of like um, you need someone that, that it's constantly managing those, um, those things. Um, I don't know if... I... I want to add something important I forgot at the beginning. We have to go one step back um, and and watch on the whole picture right now. There, there is It is easier to make games, which is cool. So you have to decide if this is something you want to live on because it could be also a really, really nice hobby. Um, and saying like, oh, making games is always equal to I have to do at least indie and sell it. It's not true. You can, I can, I know people who have a full-time job, completely something different. They do a lot of game jams. I participate, they're releasing stuff on each uh, IO um, and they're pretty happy with that. And they don't, and maybe I, I know one who's now thinking because he has one prototype that's nice, thinking of, okay, can I somehow free my time so I can spend more time on that and not starving? So he's trying to make a mix and talking with his current employee and saying, can I maybe reduce the hours? So I could live with a little bit less money and then spend time on that. So I think it is important to understand what I love right now. Is it's an art form. You can express yourself via games now, which you couldn't 10 years ago, which is awesome. But at the same time, you have to, to, to find out for yourself, is this something you want to have all this pressure and all this money stuff involved in something you maybe just enjoy as a as an expressive art. Very making similar. <laughs> Make I think we all can agree that yes, <clears throat> making games is hard. It's so just a little bit. It's sim fairly similar to the music industry as well, right? Where how many people play music in the world? Good portion of them, right? 
Now it so happens that picking up a guitar is a little bit more accessible than, you know, starting to trying to build a game, but it's slowly getting to the point where you can even, you know, build interactive experience on your cell phone, right? Um, and a cell phone is a little bit easier to get than like a high-end dev machine, you know, uh, capable of ray tracing and all the other fancy features. Um, so it is getting a little bit more democratizing. And what that means is that everyone won't be able to survive or have a comfortable life with the income that they can make from their products. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not something that you shouldn't pursue. Um, there's always compromises in life. And uh, some, sometimes you might just want to tinker with the stuff that you're excited about. And like Andrea said, potentially you might find that little golden nugget, you know, that you didn't even think about. Um, that's not should shouldn't stop anyone from trying to pursue their dreams and go all in if that's what you want to no, do. No, it's exactly what I'm saying. Go all in, but just figure out in which extent you want to do it. Not that you end up with a lot of pressure and that part you actually didn't like. Yeah. So. It's important to still have fun, especially in our industry. Um, otherwise it can get it can get rather difficult. We're about at the end of time of the stream, um, but I would like you to ask you all one question. This is actually the first question that came in, um, but I wanted to leave it for the end. Um, Kellers in Colorado asked, if you could change something about your journey, what would you do differently? <laughs> wow. And that's the stream, folks. We'll see you all next week. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Joey Pring, for the for the raid. That's really uh, hello back to Austria from here. That's really nice. <laughs> um, nothing. I think I, I, I would change say, anything. The good and bad stuff are good. Yeah, for the most part, I'm here because of all of the mistakes and the learnings that I've made so far. However, in telling myself, if I told myself at 20 when I started on this endeavor. Um, Basically, don't burn out. Like, if you feel tired and you're buggered and you, sorry, Australian lang slipping, slang slipping in, um, if you're tired and you're just exhausted, take a break. Because it's usually when your body's telling you that, you need to. Otherwise, if the worst thing you can do is burn out and scrap a project, right? Um, get it done. Yeah. And maybe, like, lose this um, sense of fear, like, um, what what I believe is like sometimes I, I it took me too long to make a mistake, you know, like I keep pushing through something that was meant uh to die or something. So I think I, I learned more every time I, I um went through the full cycle faster, right? So the fail okay, faster no, kind of philosophy. <laughs> yeah. No, I have one. I will never ever write a five hundred page game design document ever, ever again. Okay. High five. <laughs> Right there. <laughs> yeah, I think honestly, the only things I regret are the crunch, you know, over the years. I've done my fair share of crunch. I, I was at the EA Spouse Studio when that was happening, you know, and that left me with some damage that I had to recover from. And it's no matter how cool your job is, it's not worth putting yourself through the ringer physically because then you're not doing the quality of work that you wanted to do in the first place. You're grinding out a thing. And you know, you lose your love for game development, and it's the only thing that it's the art form that I love the most. So losing touch with it for a while because of that was something I really regretted, and it took a while to find my way back. But otherwise, yeah, that's why I'm here. I love doing this thing. Yeah, we... definitely feeling um, like uh, what's the word? Uh, not emotional. The kind of like where you um, you feel. <sighs> I had it in my mind. I lost it. It's early in the morning. I'm so sorry. I'll show the sunrise after. <laughs> I have a couple of minutes still in my outro spiel. Something, I, I think Martina touched on something important. Fail fast, fail click quickly, like learn from your mistakes and then continue, right? Knowing when, when to stop, knowing, you know, or, or at least don't be afraid to try again. Um, it's so much better that you fail quickly and you decide, you know what, that's not going to work out. Cut it. Um, on that note, during one of the earlier topics, um, something I've heard a lot is that a lot of first-time developers or people who are getting into game development and they start off on a project that they're planning to ship. That project is the whole world, right? 
you can't even see past your first project. And if you if this is something that you would like to continue to do for the rest of your life, you're probably going to go on to ship quite a couple of things. I know so many people that shipped 10, 15, 20 games, like actually ship them, publish them, right? Charge money or release it for free before anyone ever knew about any of the games, right? Um, and uh, do that, you know, don't... Don't be afraid to uh, even ship. Uh, I think Andreas also mentioned that you know publish it on HIO, get feedback, see if you have some, uh, find some players, maybe even a small community that will be excited to help you test your game, uh, which can be really difficult. And you can do that with a game jam prototype. Um, it's possible as long as you reach out and talk to folks. Um, this has been a pleasure. I've seen a lot of good uh, commentary from chat as well. I'm really happy we were all able to get together to talk about this topic. Um, if anyone out there is interested and have more questions or even are close to uh, releasing one of your games and you're not really sure what that entails, um, there are some official uh, steps to take as well when you're using Unreal Engine. There are very few, mostly involves one form, uh, but it's important that you do fill out that form. Um, if you have these questions, you can reach out to the evangelists. Um, there's a, a web page where everyone can read a little bit about more about you all and also find the appropriate one for their region. Um, that is indies.unrealengine.com. Is that correct? Um, yes, we shared it also on the um, Indie Week um, blog post. So if you go to the inspiring stories um, at the bottom of the post, you will find a, a link that will... Uh, show you everybody <laughs> you can you can contact us through linkedin or twitter or facebook uh instagram i don't know we we are there so just reach out all the places awesome um as a typical i will end the stream with a little bit of information for those of you who have been watching from the beginning thank you very much um it's a pleasure to have you stick around um if you have any follow-up questions I do want to point out that we announce all of our live streams on forums.unrealengine.com in the events channel. Uh, you can also see a schedule of upcoming streams in the Twitch About page, um, but there's usually more information um, and more up-to-date information on the forums. A uh, good place to go. Um, if you are enjoying some of our more technical content that we normally cover on the stream, um, we do transcribe all of our live streams. So what that means usually within a week of, uh, of us going offline, um, you can actually download the entire transcript or just turn on captions on YouTube. I should also go ahead and mention that something that we tried out last week for the first time, and I forgot to add it in the form announcement post, is that there's now a add-on for Chrome. Uh, let's get, see if Sky can go ahead and get us the link for this. But there's actually an add-on uh, in Chrome that allow you to uh, live subtitle um, uh, sort of in real time, uh, which can help a lot. I'm a non-native English speaker, and I've lived most of my life with captions on, and I think it has taught me a lot, especially when it comes to technical terms, which can be a little bit difficult sometimes to know what was said. Uh, so go ahead and control F that transcript if there's a term you were looking for or when we were talking about anything in particular. Um, there are no physical meetups going on in the world right now, but communities.unrealengine.com is the place to go to find the meetup groups local to your area. Um, there are some of them that are actually throwing virtual events right now, various discords around the world, and it's a good place to find people that are interested in, in developing games or other various experiences with Unreal Engine. Uh, go ahead and check that out. Um, in terms of marketing and publishing your game, um, I we do have a countdown video at the beginning of all of our live streams. This is 30 minutes of development that you speed up to five minutes. You send that to us uh, together separately with your logo and information about your, uh, about your game. Um, and you might become one of the countdowns that we air on the stream every week. Uh, same goes for our community spotlights. We spotlight three every week um, on our News and Community Spotlight segment, as well as in the Epic Games Launcher. These are projects that we either find on Twitter, Facebook, our forums, um, there are many good places uh, where you can post even work in progress, uh, and we'd love to see this, and so go ahead and do that. Uh, shout out to unrealslackers.org as well if you're looking for uh, the largest unofficial Unreal Engine community out there. It's a great place for real-time communication. Um, if you stream on Twitch... We, we have the, the unofficial Spanish also uh, Discord. So uh, for people talking in Espanol, les digo, escribanme, les paso el link. The Discord no official de Unreal in Espanol. That's it. Gracias. Um, 
if you stream on Twitch, make sure that you use the Unreal Engine tag as well as the game development tag. That's the easiest way for us to filter and find your content. And uh, make sure you follow us on social media. That is where we do all of our updates in regards to news for the engine, um, but also other exciting um, exciting news. And the streams. Um, we tweet every Thursday morning, East Coast time, uh, in regards to what topic we're going to cover today. If you're not too keen on follow the, sort of the, the, the forums and you prefer Twitter, we talk about that as well. Um, next week on Inside Unreal, we have uh, two of the developers from Torn Banner. They're coming on to talk about uh, making massive medieval maps with uh, Chivalry 2. If you don't know the studio Torn oh, Banner, nice. they're developing Chival they develop Chivalry and they are coming now to talk about Chivalry 2, which I'm really excited about. I've talked to them, I think, since E3 2019 was when we first, um, first saw a little bit of a glimpse of the game. So they'll be on the stream next week. I'm super excited about that. Um, but until then, uh, I want to thank you all once again for coming on the stream. Thanks, chat, for hanging out today. Um, if you didn't miss, if you missed a part of the stream, uh, you can always watch them uh, on demand on both YouTube and Twitch uh, perpetually afterwards. Uh, I know we've gone ahead and posted those links. You can also find an informed announcement post. And with that, I've talked a little bit. I want you all to get a moment to say um, anything you would like to leave chat with today before we go offline. You give us a word again, which you know that it takes hours again when everybody. It's okay. I tried. I, we're past that now. And <laughs> you gave up, right? It was I'm fun, looking forward guys. for the thank next you so stream. Much so, for hosting yeah, this thanks, Victor, and everybody that is watching. Thank you for coming. Thank you All very right. much, and uh, good morning from Australia as well. <laughs> good morning from Australia. Thanks, Alex, good, good night from Germany. So <laughs> yes, and good afternoon from East Coast. <laughs> when I'm you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much. We'll see you again next week. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.